from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came, and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life, and Jesus looked him up and down, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there, we met a priest, a Monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my PhD degree at the University of Chicago. And one day I was riding in a bus and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder and she said, sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, that's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now he said my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period but he said, something happened, you can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever, something happened to me. Now the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him. Because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich, he was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again. Born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world? Lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in scripture to describe it. I'll take only three words.
One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you so that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word, iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state, maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. And the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat. And the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now. And a counselor is standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master. Help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country. So call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life. Finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God to be acceptable by God. Now, some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. 
Now, I used an illustration years ago that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at three o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never going to drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. <laughs> I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? Now, I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. <laughs> I can remember when there were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, and he said, I think we've got it, and got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. There were only two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have New Year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit 
regenerate you. That's when you're born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps, and people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things He did, and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw My Fair Lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now, to be born again means, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by parts of a roof torn off flying by, the dust going by, the willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind, and neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, Natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now, you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation, or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 
1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now tonight you are hearing and you're hearing the word of God and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching or declaration or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit as I've already explained. He convicts and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. All things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God the Holy Spirit live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper. And he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went, and when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times, and on the seventh time you will be healed. He told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere. Didn't even come out and greet him. Just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you'd have done it. He said, go to the Jordan. He said, yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, but why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River. And he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living. And you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike. And then by faith, receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior. And then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says he that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. You just can't come to God anytime you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing and he's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. 
He hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you, but I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week and let him know about your desire and we'll send you some helps through the mails that will encourage you and help you make your decision for Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Toward the battle, into the darkness, anytime, anywhere. This is our mission, sharing hope. Jesus! The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, always bringing good news. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to turn to John's Gospel, the eighth chapter. The eighth chapter of John's Gospel. And this passage of Scripture, the 32nd verse, the 32nd verse of the eighth chapter of John's Gospel. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's having a debate with some of the religious leaders of his day. And he said, ye shall know the truth. Now that word shall could be translated must. You must know the truth if you are to be free. Tonight I want to talk about truth and freedom. We hear a great deal about both today. You know, there's an old Scottish oath upon which our American oath is based, and it reads this way. I pledge before Almighty God, before whom I will give an answer on the day of judgment, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now in this passage of Scripture, Jesus discussed two personalities. He discussed God on the one hand, who is truth, and Satan on the other, who is, the, who is a liar and the author of lies. Now here's what Jesus said. He was pretty rough in some of the things he said. He turned to these religious leaders and he said, You are of your father, the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there was no truth in him. 
When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said that there's the lie and the truth. And in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, we are told that in the latter days of this age, there will be a system called the lie. And a great delusion will sweep over the people of that generation. They will believe a lie. And they will reject the truth. Many people think we're living in that generation. And the Apostle Paul said in the first chapter of Romans that the people of that day had changed the truth of God into a lie. And then secondly, not only do we exchange the truth of God for a lie, but Paul said in Romans, the first chapter, the 18th verse, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, you can know the truth and not live it. This is holding the truth of God in unrighteousness. The Bible says the wrath of God is against such people. And that's why Christ was so bitter in his denunciation of the hypocrites. You hold the truth intellectually, but you don't live it. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You can hold the truth in unrighteousness, and that brings about the wrath of God. And then thirdly, Paul said, judgment according to truth, Romans 2.2. 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. In other words, someday God is going to judge the world. Yes. There's a day of judgment coming. Just as certain as I'm standing here, a day of judgment is coming and God is going to judge us according to the truth. Did we live by the truth? Did we believe the truth? Did we accept the truth? What was our attitude toward the truth? Or did we exchange the truth for a lie? Or did we hold the truth in unrighteousness? God will hold us accountable, the scripture says. Jesus said, you must know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, you know, that's what philosophy has been doing, and that's what science does, and that's what we do in psychology. In every field of study, in every discipline, we're searching for truth. We're trying to find what the laws are. We're trying to find what the truth is. Now, early in childhood, we soon learned the truth that fire is hot. We learned that ice is cold. We learned that doing wrong makes us feel guilty and doing good makes us feel good. We learned that early. You see, all of us really are on a quest for truth. What is the truth about myself? Where did I come from? Why in the world did God ever put us on this planet if there's a God? And where are we going? Is there life after death? I'm searching for answers. All of us are, consciously or unconsciously. We ask ourselves these questions. What is truth? The same question Pilate asked 2,000 years ago. And that's why a lot of these kids are taking LSD and mind expansion psychedelic drugs. They're trying to find some experiences that will lead them into some sort of a spiritual truth. Now, truth is important in mathematics, it's important in chemistry, it's important in science, and it's important in the spiritual life. It's important in morality. It's important to find the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. No guesswork, no speculation is allowed. In aviation, you can make one mistake nowadays and may crash into another plane. You must know the truth. Now, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. The Apostle Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. The Apostle John said, you can know that you're saved. The Bible teaches that you can know the truth. You can find the truth. You can believe the truth. But what is the truth? Every religion and every philosophy may have some of the truth. But there is one place you can find all the truth. Where is it? Jesus said, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
Buddha said, I'm still searching for truth at the end of his life. But Jesus made this astounding claim. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the embodiment of all truth. And if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to believe that. And you've got to take it by faith. Well, you say anybody that would come along and say, I'm the embodiment of all truth. He must be mentally deranged. He's an egomaniac. Yes, you can, you can make that. You can make a case for that. Or maybe Jesus just told a lie. He knew it wasn't true and he just lied. Yes, that's one of the options. But suppose he is the truth. Suppose he is the embodiment of all truth. And you reject it and exchange the truth for a lie. Then you have made a fatal error for eternity. Now, I personally believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that he is the embodiment of all truth. I have accepted that by faith, and when I took that step and took that stand, it changed my life. And it's very simple. And he made it so simple that you can know the truth that a blind man, a deaf man, a black man, a yellow man, a red man can come and know the truth. The educated man can know the truth. The uneducated can know the truth. I know people that don't have any education at all. And they know this truth. And it gives them a satisfaction and a joy. And I know professors at the great universities and I know some of the great scientists. They have come and accepted this as the truth and bowed in humility before the Christ back of science. And it's changed their lives. Truth. The profoundest truth in simplicity. So that anybody can come and anybody can believe, even children. Whittier once said, we search the world for truth. We call the good and the pure and the beautiful from graven stone and written scroll, from all the plowed fields of the soul and weary seekers of the best, we come back laden from the quest to find that all the stage is set in the book our mothers read. It's here. Jesus Christ, the story of Christ, he is the truth. And Jesus said this in that same chapter, in the 24th verse, he said, If ye believe not, listen to this, If you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you believe not that I am the embodiment of all truth, you're going to die in your sins. You must come and believe and accept and commit Yes, Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. And Jesus told the truth. He told the truth about sin. Where does the lust and the greed and the pride and the hate and the jealousy and the fighting come from? Why, does, why do people hate each other? Why do they fight and kill and every generation has a war? We've had 55 wars since World War II. Why, why all of this throughout history? The Bible tells us man has a disease of the heart called sin. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and blasphemy and pride. All of these things come from within and defile a man. We're suffering from only one disease in the world. Our problem is not a race problem, really. Our problem is not a poverty problem. Our problem is not a war problem. Our problem is a heart problem. We need to get the heart changed, the heart transformed. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must have a new nature, a new heart that will be dominated by love. Ah, but we go out and say, we ought to love each other. 
and we, saw, and we soon find that we don't have the capacity to love each other, where are we going to get it? We get it from Jesus. You see, the Spirit of God comes into our heart the moment we receive Christ, and He begins to produce in your heart love and joy and peace and patience and temperance. All of these fruits of the Spirit are produced supernaturally by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. He told the truth about what is wrong with the world. And then he told the truth about our social responsibility, our responsibility to our fellow man. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 35, you'll find it. People were hungry, they were sick, they were tired, they were cold. And they were visited in prison. They were visited and they were helped. And at the judgment, Jesus commended them. They said, but Lord, we didn't know that we visited you. We didn't know that we fed you. We didn't know that we did that for you. Jesus said, if you did it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And every time that you give of your time and your energy and your money to help those in need, you're helping Jesus. You're giving to him. And then he told the truth about judgment. He warned us to flee the wrath of God. Every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment, he said. There is a judgment coming. He told the truth about repentance. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. You say, but how do I repent? You say, oh God, I've sinned. I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing to live in a new dimension of life. I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. That's repentance. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. He told the truth about that. He told the truth about conversion. He said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Be converted. We're frightened of that word in religion. We use it in everything else, but not in religion. Young people want an experience. They want something that means something. They have their happenings and they want to do their thing and they want to take their drug, they want their kicks. And in the church, we've stifled out any kind of religious experience. Jesus said you need to be converted. I can remember the day I was converted. I had an experience with God. It wasn't an emotional experience with me. Some people it is. Nothing wrong with emotion. We've got certainly emotional intellectualism today on campus. I see these intellects on campus on television and boy, they're shouting it up pretty loud for their cause and what they believe. No, we allow emotion for everything except Christ. If anybody sheds a tear on religion, they say too much emotion. And that's one of the devil's lies and the devil's tricks so that we've lost all feeling in our faith and all joy in our faith and all the excitement and the thrill that these early Christians had. Jesus said you need to be converted. Now the word conversion simply means to change. Turn around. You're going in one direction on the broad road that leads to destruction. Turn around and go in the right direction. Go the narrow road that leads to eternal life. That's what it means, conversion to change, to turn around. Has that happened to you? Have you changed your way of living? Have you had an experience with Christ? Do you know him personally? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now I know that there are many people that think they're free already, and they don't know Christ. They think they know how to live. The Bible says there is a way, there's a way, outside of Christ, that seems right unto man. It seems the right thing. But the end is death and judgment. I have a little boy, and when he was much smaller, three years of age, we were loaned a boat down in Florida. And uh, we were going down the river. My friend Lee Fisher was back there trying to get the fishing gear ready, and I was running the boat, and my little boy, Ned, said, Daddy, I want to run this boat. And I said, no, I don't think you know how to run it. Oh, yes, I know exactly how to do it, he said. And he pushed my hands out of the way, so I let him have the wheels. 
and he was heading right toward the rocks. You see, we all say, Lord, we know how to run our lives. Don't you interfere. We're, we're going to be all right. We can handle it. Nothing we can't handle. But Jesus warns us that you're heading for the rocks. You're in trouble. Emptiness, neurosis, complexes of various sorts set in, and ultimately the judgment. Repent. Be converted while you can. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Now what does the truth do? It sets you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free from what? First, it sets you free. Christ sets you free from the penalty of sin. Yes, there's a penalty to sin. Now we're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner, and we're all under the penalty of sin sin which is death the wages of sin is death the Bible says now death carries with it the idea of separation from God in this life and in the life to come the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said what must I do to inherit eternal life he wanted life here and he wanted life to come because he felt the deadness of his spirit and the deadness of his soul but he wasn't willing to pay the price there's a price if you come to Christ. The rich young ruler tried to bargain with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to lower the flag. He wanted Jesus to change the rules for him so he could get into the kingdom. But Jesus will never lower the flag. He'll never compromise. He'll never change the rules. You've got to come to Christ just like people did 2,000 years ago if you're able to get to heaven. We live in sophisticated America. We thought we had all the answers and look at us sending a man to the moon with one hand and building gigantic bombs and rockets with the other to blow the world to pieces. Campuses torn apart. Society being ripped apart. No, we don't have all the answers because you see, we rejected the truth. We rejected Christ. Receive Christ in your life. Let him come and put the pieces back together in your life. Forgive your sin and give you purpose and meaning to your life and take the penalty of sin away. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ. He removes the penalty. Secondly, he, set you, he can set you free from the power of sin. He said, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin in this chapter. But when you receive Christ, this power of sin to dominate your life is broken. Sin shall no longer dominate in your life, said Paul to the Romans. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You can reckon yourself to be dead to sin. So that sin may be in your life, you may commit a sin, but it doesn't dominate you. You don't make sin a practice in your life. You have power over sin, the Spirit of God living in you through a new nature that God gives you. And then thirdly, he sets us free ultimately from the very presence of sin. You read the Revelation, the 21st chapter and the 22nd chapter, and you will see the most glorious description of heaven and the future world. And then it says this. It says, on the outside of this new world, this utopia that is called heaven, that God is building now for those that trust him. For without are the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. All liars, all people that live a lie will be on the outside, he said, excluded and banished from the presence of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There was an ad in the New York Times today, a whole page that said, come to life. Great big boxcar letters, come to life. I'm asking you tonight to come to life. Come to the truth, to the source of life. To Jesus Christ the Son of God 
someday we'll be removed from the very presence of sin and the devil and all lies. We shall overcome someday. Till then, we can have God's life right here on this earth. We can have a little bit of heaven. We can be set free from the bondage of sin and slavery and the devil right now. Christ can set you free. I'm asking you tonight by faith to receive him. To receive the truth. Notice I said by faith. You cannot come with your mind alone because your mind was affected by sin. You have to come like a little child, except you become his children and be converted, said Jesus. You have to come like a little child, by simple childlike faith and receive it. And if you will, he comes into your heart, gives you a new nature, and you can go out and live a new life. Now, it's hard and it's tough and it's rough to follow Christ. I don't want you to come under any false illusion. But when you make that commitment, you don't go back into the world and back to your house and back to your neighborhood to live the Christian life alone. He goes with you. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and receive him openly and publicly. Every person that he called in the New Testament, he called publicly. There was a reason for it. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Come publicly. I'm going to ask you from all over this stadium to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently and say tonight, I want to receive Christ. I want the truth. I want the truth to dominate my life. But you get up and come right now from all over, men, women, young people. God has spoken to you tonight. You need Christ. You come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. I do not know whether you can see this great scene here at the garden in New York or not, but hundreds of people are coming from all over this great amphitheater to receive Christ as the way and the truth and the life in their hearts. You can make that same commitment right now in your home where you are watching by television. God help you to make that commitment tonight. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at